Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another program of Beacon of Truth. When we talk of a specific subject or try to gain insight into a specific issue, we have to be fully familiar with the jargons which connect with that subject. Similarly, when we talk of the promised Messiah والسلام, and the latter days um, when he was to ap appear and the advent of the promised Messiah, we have to be fully familiar with some of the terminology uh, to be used in this subject. In today's uh, program, we're going to discuss the ahadith, the sayings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with regards this, with, with regards to this subject, and the topics which uh, surround this. But before doing so, um, I mean, I would like to say here that some people refrain from such subjects. I mean, the ahadith, the sayings of the Prophet, due to a couple of reasons. Maybe that because they were compiled some 150 to 200 years after the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's death they're not um, so much authentic as the Holy Quran is or maybe that because it's in the Arabic language and the people are not familiar with the Arabic language many of the Muslims uh, in the present day are not familiar with the Arabic language then they refrain from it and say uh, you know we'll read the translation that should suffice but firstly it should be understood that the Holy Prophet the promised Messiah in many of his books has honored the status of the ahadith and has said that without the ahadith it was impossible for us to understand the rank and the commentary of the Holy Quran, the true commentary and it's a fact that the Holy Prophet ﷺ's commentary is the best possible commentary with regards to the Holy Quran. Secondly, knowledge is something which goes with us till our grave and we have to keep gaining that and Religion isn't just a way of life, but religion is a knowledge which we have to continue gaining to gain nearness to Allah the Almighty. I mean, to sit quietly and to pray isn't enough. To merely learn the prayers is a knowledge in itself. So we have to um, attempt to learn this knowledge as much as possible. And a hadith is one of those knowledges. So when we talk about this in this subject, uh, in this um, program, sorry, I do recommend our viewers that please do go back and listen to this program and try and gain an insight, a further insight with regards to the ahadith concerning the promised Messiah والسلام, so that we may not just be blind followers of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat but truly follow our beloved Imam Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen, Hazrat Nizam Masoor Ahmed Sahib Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Nasrih al-Aziz in the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. So like I said, we're going to discuss the ahadith, uh, the sayings of the Holy Prophet, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to the Promised Messiah and the latter days, both which go hand in hand and his advent in that time. Um, and to help us in doing so, we have with us uh, a panel of uh, guests who are from the Ahmadiyya Muslim youth. Uh, on my left, we have with us Shehzad Ahmed Sahib. In the middle, we have Raza Ahmed Sahib. And on the immediate uh, right, we have uh, Kashif Mahmoud Birk Sahib and inshallah to enable us to understand further and representing the audience at home we have with us Majlis Khudam al Hertfordshire region to ask uh, questions to our panel of guests. Uh, having said that I would like to say here that if there is any question which the viewers at home do want to ask with regards to today's subject then please do not hesitate in contacting us on the details being shown on the screen because obviously this program is only beneficial when you put your input into this program and that's the main reason for it to be uh, broadcasted on MTA International. Kashif Sab, uh, coming straight into the program, obviously before speaking of um, the ahadith, the sayings of the Holy Prophet وسلم, I mean, when he speaks of the promised Messiah Islam, he speaks of, you know, he speaks in uh, ways of prophecies, their prophecies which he gave regarding uh, the coming years. So can you just, I mean, prior to speaking on this subject, can you just give us an insight into prophecies? What are prophecies? What types of prophecies are there? Yes, indeed. Prophecies are a forecast of the future, telling you of events that will eventually happen a, a, a time ahead and prophets use these uh, get this information from God and convey it to mankind from the study of the Holy Quran we understand that all prophecies aren't like literal to be taken literal so they are defined as muhkamat uh, muhkamat and mutashabihat muhkamat are such prophecies which are clear and unequivocal meaning that they are fulfilled in the manner which they are presented 
and mutashabihat means such which are unveiled or obscure or metaphorical, which have to be interpreted. I'll give you some examples. For example, the, uh, in the Holy Quran, it says about the people of Lot, salam, when he warned his people, and they ultimately they rejected him. And God told Hazrat Lot salam, that in the morning coming after this, I will destroy these people. And this is what actually happened. The very next day on the morning, they were punished. Similarly, in the time, lifetime of the Holy Prophet salam, we know of the famous ev uh, event when the Holy Prophet salam, was persecuted and uh, 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 a Meccan named Suraka bin Malik followed him. And the Prophet salam, uh, in the end told him that how will your condition be when the bangles of the king of Persia will be put in on your hands. And we know that this prophecy was fulfilled literally. And uh, at the time of Hazrat Umar, this, these bangles were put in his hand. But many prophecies are, as I said, obscure, and they're fulfilled in a manner which are not expected. For example, we have the, when the Holy Prophet ﷺ, before he migrated to Medina, he saw in a vision that he had actually traveled to a country where there were lofty uh, date palms. And the Holy Prophet ﷺ thought that maybe this is Yamama or Hajar, it says in Hadith, two places. And ultimately, it turned out to be Medina. And uh, the interpretation of the Prophet ﷺ was not true in that sense, but it was fulfilled, and it actually did happen. From the Holy Quran, there is another clear example where it says that the Holy Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was mentioned in Torah and Injil. It says that the people of the book yajiduna hu maktuban in the hum fit Torah wal Injil, that Jews and Christians found references in their respective scriptures that the Holy Prophet ﷺ was to come. But what happened was when the Holy Prophet ﷺ came, finally, a few, very few people of the book, very few Christians and Jews accepted him. And uh, the result uh, to be drawn from that is that maybe the prophecies mentioned in the Bible were metaphors and not fulfilled in the literal sense as they expected it. So there are many clear examples we find in these scriptures. And uh, so prophetical words are few, but they contain many meanings. And there are many examples of this found in earlier scriptures. So we have to have this in mind. When we study prophecies, they're not to be taken literally. Rather, they are in prophetic command. I would like to give an example of Prophet Jesus Islam. It says, one of the writers of the gospel says about Jesus that he spake unto them only in parables. And we find that the New Testament is full of when Jesus speaks to his people. It is in a language which very few, I think, in f who were in front of him at that time understood, actually and uh, they're to be taken in a metaphorical sense. Mm -hmm. not, uh, do you want to give any examples of the Holy Quran, from the Holy Quran? From the Holy Quran, we find, for example, it says about hypocrites, Sumun bukmun omyun. Now, they're referring to them as deaf, dumb, and blind. This is not to be taken literally. Of course, it's in a spiritual sense, because hypocrites at that time, Ubay bin, uh, Ubay bin Sulul, could see and everything. So other than that, we find that about women and men, uh, the relation between husband and wife, hunna libasulakum wa antum libasulahun. In a metaphorical sense, they are referred to as garments for each other. So the, the Holy Quran is full. And it says, in one place, it says, tilka limsalo nadribuha linnase wa ma yaakiloha illa alimun. That these are <coughs> examples we put forward to mankind, but only those who are firmly grasped in knowledge actually do understand them. Yeah, brilliant. Jazakallah, uh, Kashif Obviously, we know that um, it's quite important, the context which um, are in those prophecies. We have to understand those contexts, because without that, we can't understand, I mean, the background and everything with regards to that prophecy. There is a background always uh, with regards to prophecies which are made um, by prophets especially. Uh, Sahib, can you just explain some of those contexts? I mean, what context was the Holy Prophet talking in when he spoke of the promised Messiah, a promised Messiah coming in his Ummah? Okay. Um, in Sahih Muslim Kitab al Fitan, there's a whole chapter about this uh, topic. It's, uh, there's various hadiths and uh, uh, things mentioned, uh, signs and the context and the, 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 the prophecies that have to be fulfilled in order to determine the time of the Promised Messiah والسلام, and the latter days. Um, for example, I'll give you three examples. Um, the first one, uh, which is a famous example everybody knows and talks about it, is uh, about uh, the Dajjal. When the Holy Prophet والسلام, mentioned the coming of the Dajjal and what he will do and how he will look and everything else, he also mentioned at the same time that when the Muslims of that time, 
when they survive to see him, they should recite the first few verses of Surat Al-Kahf. Now, if you look at Surat Al-Kahf, what does it talk about? The main subject matter discussed in uh, those few verses in the beginning is about Christianity. So this links to the fact that the Dajjal is not a physical being like it is presented by or believed by the majority of the Muslims riding on a donkey with the one eye and everything else. A ridiculous concept. But it refers to those nations and the powers and the negative influence the Christian nations will have on the Muslims. And that is actually, it's not a physical being, but it, but it is a force and it's, it's, it's representing uh, a whole uh, society. And that's the, the, the force we have to fight. Secondly, um, there is the mention of a thing called the beast of the earth. Now the beast of the earth, is in the hadith it says Dabatul uh, Ars. You can also say it's a worm, worm of the earth. What is that worm? You look at the scientific uh, background of, or, or the scientific origin of the plague, for example. How does the plague come into being? You know, people always think, or usually the concept is believed that you, know, you have rats, but rats are only the mean through which plague is uh, spread uh, unto humanity. The origin of the plague is a small, tiny bacteria found in water and soil referring to the Dabatul Ars. Ars means earth. Then the third one that the Holy Prophet ﷺ mentioned is uh, Yajuj and Majuj, Gog and Magog. Now these two forces, again it's forces, as Qashif Sahib said already explained that we cannot take them literally. Um, it is also referred to the Western nations, especially the Russians and the British people. When people think about Russians and British, always they, the, the, the concept of the American uh, powers or what their role is comes into play. Hazrat Masih Maud says that the, uh, that the American forces and, uh, are, are connected to the British uh, because uh, you know, they were, they, they're linked. I'm sorry, it's not Hazrat Masih Maud um, And again, these forces are also mentioned in the Bible, uh, for example, the book of Ezekiel talks about uh, 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 these packs. And the Promised Messiah says that it actually mentions the word Moscow in the Bible. And that is uh, mentioned in one of the books of the Promised Messiah. Brilliant. I mean, the, the, fact, that the, the, the fact that you mentioned about Dabatul Arz, that's been mentioned in the Holy Quran, one of the many other things which, uh, one of the many, many things which has been mentioned in the Holy Quran and then been uh, interpreted by the Ahadith in the Holy Quran, it states I think that when um, the duty has been fulfilled upon them, then we will bring forth for them a, a, a um, as you said, worm from the earth. So obviously when uh, the message has been conveyed and we see that by the time of the Holy Prophet ﷺ's demise, the message had been conveyed. When the message had been conveyed and no one was accepting, that was the time of the Promised Messiah ﷺ. Everyone had dispersed into their own um, commentaries of Islam. Then uh, Allah the Almighty brought forth the plague in the time of the Promised Messiah, which was one of those signs which, as you quite rightly said, established the truthfulness of uh, the Promised Messiah ﷺ. Shazad Saab, coming just before uh, coming to you, I understand we have a few questions. Um, if you could please uh, ask your question. Um, my question is that um, when you talk about the, the, this literary meaning, like even Quran and all this as well, when the question comes in mind, then Allah Almighty knew this. Obviously, God knows we need to believe that Allah Almighty knew everything. So, I mean, is there any hikmah, hikmah behind this that when the God you know, speaks to this? Uh, um, that literally meaning, I mean, is there, what's the Lord mean the hikmah behind it? Behind, uh, I mean, I mean, behind the 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 literally meaning, the literally meaning. speaks about. You. Perfect, Akash uh, if you could please. Uh. Speaking about the wisdom of why certain prophecies are veiled in, or obscure, unclear, and are not, not fulfilled in the manner that which in the, which they are presented. Is that what you're asking? No, I mean, when, my question is when Allah Almighty knew everything about the knowledge of people, right. they will have a difficulty to understand. They right. won't understand the literally meaning. They will take it, obviously. It comes to, it so comes to the, the same thing, it, yes. Allah Almighty, so. The reason for that is that the Holy Quran mentions about, when it speaks about faith in the Holy Quran, it says, faith in the unseen. God wishes that our faith should be put at test at times, because everyone, it's not like it's a test where everyone is going to pass. <laughs> 
rather God has given us the intellect and now he wishes us to see how we use, it, use that intellect. That is why he speaks in terms, like uh, the verse I quoted, that some signs of Allah are such that only the most knowledgeable people accept them. And what should be the, the, the duty of the others who do not understand these uh, prophetical, because words of prophet are metaphorical. So those who understand these prophecies, they present uh, explanation to all mankind and they are to look, are these explanations, uh, why, uh, like, are, are they holding, are they strong? Are they being fulfilled in front of us? So in, that, in light of these ex experiences, they should see, is this prophecy fulfilled or not? But literal prophecies serve no purpose because it, puts, it doesn't put our faith into, uh, into test. So that is what I think. Brilliant. Uh, I mean, another thing that the grandeur, the, the, the greatness of someone is recognized by his knowledge. And obviously Allah the Almighty being the all knowing, all hearing, all seeing. If we expect I mean, him to give something which is so literal that it has one meaning, then we can't really worship his glory. We can't really worship his wisdom because he says something, we've accepted it, but we don't when we've heard or accepted the fact that he's given a message which only has or bears one meaning, I mean, the Holy Quran, we know that there, there's a commentary and then there are many meanings, I mean, thousands of meanings to merely just one verse. If we just say for argument's sake that there is one meaning, that doesn't really show the greatness of Allah the Almighty because similarly, I mean, if we look at a poet, if he gives um, a blatant, you know, a description of a specific person, we can't really say that that poet is a very great person because that, po that poet hasn't described it in many ways. One stanza of a poet will have many meanings and that is the sign of a great poet. I mean, take William, the Shake William uh, Shakespeare for instance. I mean, he's has, he has many meanings in what he says and that is his greatness. Had he only given one meaning, it would be merely prose and not a poem. Um, do you want to also, add anything? One prophecy doesn't have to be fulfilled once only. You know, there's a prophecy which can be fulfilled two times, three times, four times. Mm -hmm depending on the greatness and the grandeur of the prophecy. Another thing I'd like to mention, uh, if, I, if, I, if I may, is that, you know, Allah Ta'ala says in the beginning, uh, Surah, uh, Surah Baqarah, that about the Holy Quran, uh, Holy Quran, that this is a book for the righteous, those who believe in the unseen, right? And it is a test, basically. We have the, the system of reward and punishment. If there are certain people who are up to that standard of recognizing those, uh, those uh, prophecies and those, uh, those signs of, of God in those books, then they get a certain reward. But those who are not able to, they, they fall into the category of punishment and, and uh, the, uh, ignorance. Right? And that's, that's a system of God that He has established from the beginning. Those who have the <coughs> insight and the <coughs> spiritual wisdom from I I within their, their nature, they will be able to recognize these things. But those who are black from the inside, they, they can't recognize these things. And in fact, I mean, the best example of um, taking uh, in mind, I mean, what you said about Yominun Abil Ghaib, that believing in the unseen, the best example is the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. When Hazrat Amir al Mu'minin, Ayd al Allah bin Asil Aziz, when the Khalifa Waqt, he stands on his podium and he uh, proposes a scheme. We don't know the background behind it because he, he foresees something, you know, many years ahead, hundreds of many years ahead, I mean, for the benefit and the prosperity of the world and the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat. But we immediately, I mean, as soon as he said it, we strive and, you know, offer our sacrifices for that specific scheme. And that is the best example of believing in the unseen. We believe that that, that scheme which Hazur has mentioned is definitely something from Allah the Almighty and it benefits uh, Islam and it is something which uh, promises the prosperity of Islam. Gosh, Sahib, you can briefly... Uh, I could just mention another wisdom behind why these prophecies are such. It shows the great relation between God and His prophets and I'd like to give the example of the Battle of Badr where God Almighty actually had promised the Holy Prophet وسلم, that you will be victorious. But in the battlefield itself, the Holy Prophet وسلم, is reported to have been praying fervently and very humbly to God Almighty that please do not make, make us victorious. Even though God had promised him that you will be victorious, the Prophet knew that the wisdom of, and the knowledge of God is so vast, maybe he intends something which I cannot understand yet. And this shows the great relation of Holy Prophet وسلم, to God Almighty. Sometimes the Prophet himself who receives the revelation does not know how it's going to be fulfilled. And this so shows that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, exactly. I think yeah, we've quite put quite a lot into that. So that's how coming straight uh, to you. Um, inshallah, we'll come to the audience in just a moment. We've just heard from Raza Saab previously, just before the um, question asked his question, that 
there are various contexts in which prophecies are given, and the Holy Prophet ﷺ spoke in a given context. But what were the signs, I mean the actual signs which the Holy Prophet ﷺ mentioned about the advent of the Promised Messiah <laughs> Islam? You see, one of the, the greatest prophecies of Islam is the prophecy concerning the advent of the Promised Messiah Islam, that was going to take place in the latter days because of the fact that the, the rejuvenation of Islam and the renaissance of Islam is going to take place by his advent. Now, in the Ahadith, we find that the Holy Prophet um, has mentioned many signs concerning the advent of the Promised Messiah in terms of uh, his name, uh, his lineage, uh, the time of his advent, the particular tasks that he was going to, to do and so on and so forth. However, if we take all of these signs in the literal sense, then we will find ourselves in a very difficult situation because we will have so many uh, signs and prophecies regarding this one particular person, yet they are all, most of them are all apparently contradicting each other. Coming back to Kashfi Sahib's point that these prophecies and these signs have to be taken in, in, the, in terms of their context and also we have to be aware that one of the, the element or the feature of the prophetic language is that the use of metaphors. Therefore, we shouldn't take everything in the literal sense and whatever has been said as a metaphor should be understood and interpreted as a metaphor. And one such example of this is um, the Holy Prophet ﷺ has mentioned uh, the Promised Messiah, has referred to the Promised Messiah as Isa ibn Maryam. Now, we obviously know that this isn't uh, Hazrat Isa wasalam, who came almost 2,000 years ago because the Holy Quran and the Ahadith prove that he has passed away. Why he has been he has been referred to as Isa ibn Maryam is because the Holy Quran, uh, Allah the Almighty, he uh, compares the Holy Prophet ﷺ's prophethood to that of Prophet Moses. Now we find that after the demise of Prophet Moses ﷺ, 1400 years later, a Messiah appeared, Hazrat Isa ﷺ. Similarly, 1400 years after the demise of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, a Messiah was going to appear. So therefore to emphasize that similarity in terms of their, their role, in terms of the time of the advent, this, uh, th this name was given as Isa ibn Maryam. Then there is another sign that he will descend uh, upon or along uh, or beside a white minaret in the east of Damascus. Now again there is no question of anyone descending quite literally physically from the heavens onto a minaret. This obviously is a metaphor. And what it means by white minaret now we all know that a minaret is used for the azan, for the call of prayer. And from there your voice is projected far and wide. So this basically states that when the Messiah will appear, he will come at such a time when the, means, the various means of communication will have greatly advanced. And that's exactly the case. And but sorry, just yeah, 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 of course. But I mean, we see that the Promised Messiah, in obedience, I mean, in complete love with the prophecy, he Absolutely. tried to fulfill it to in fulfill the physical it way as well. And we Although see. We, we take it as a metaphor, but he also, exactly. just as you said, because you're absolutely right. But at the same time, there are many prophecies and signs that are fulfilled literally as well. For instance, uh, the prophecies uh, concerning his uh, appearance, saying that he would have um, a, a brownish uh, complexion of color and long black straight hair, that he would be of a Persian descent, and the great sign of the, uh, the eclipse on the sun and moon. All of these were fulfilled literally. So we, the point that we are trying to make here is that all these signs and all these prophecies have to be, have to be seen from a much wider uh, perspective and from a more logical perspective. And whatever has been, has been uh, intended as a metaphor should be understood as a metaphor. And whatever has been intended as, as a literal meaning should obviously be taken as a literal meaning. And then you will see that how every sign that has been mentioned in the Ahadith or by the Holy Prophet وسلم, is fulfilled in the person of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan alayhi salatu wasalam. that's a brilliant. Um, and just one other thing, in addition to what you've said, you spoke about Isa ibn Maryam, the, promise, the Holy Prophet وسلم, calling the coming Messiah as Isa ibn Maryam. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, he was the Messiah. And then in another place, in one place, the promised Messiah, or I'm not sure if it was the second Khalifa or the promised Messiah, they said that if someone is a scientist or you know, so if someone gains, uh, or excels in his specific field, I mean, say we have a scientist, right? We call that boy, I mean, I'm a teacher and we, you know, there's a student in front of me, I'll call him Einstein, you know? We, there are various names we give to a specific person who has gone to the highest degree of that caliber. And Allah the Almighty in that very manner has called him, you know, a gr the greatest degree of Isa ibn Maryam, the Messiah. And we see, 
in uh, tafsir kabir uh, i think um, hazrat muslim al razila ta'ala who has um, portrayed many similarities between isa ibn maryam and uh, the promised messiah alayhi salatu wasalam if i'm not mistaken it may be in another place but in our literature it's contained in tazkirat al shahadatain we see that the promised messiah alayhi salatu wasalam has drawn uh, many similarities between um, uh, Isa ibn Maryam and himself. Uh, Kasha, if you'd like to add something. Uh, I would say that when you discuss these things with, uh, with non Ahmadis, and they appear surprised, oh, how can, how come that when Jesus is mentioned in Hadith, you mean it is meant with it a similar person to Jesus? You can say that the Holy Quran it refers to the Holy Prophet as somebody like Moses. Similarly, when the Holy Prophet ﷺ spoke about the de degeneration of his people, he said that my people, people will become like the Jews. So why is it so surprising that even the Messiah of the Muslims should be called Isa ibn Maryam? Because then the similarity is completed in that sense. And we should remember also that doubt cannot break conviction. Conviction is these signs we spoke in literal sense which were fulfilled. His complexion, the time, the strength of Christianity, now those are not fulfilled in, the, in that sense, should be interpreted. Otherwise, we'll just waste uh, these p splendid sp prophecies of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, which were fulfilled and which the world witnessed to and which can serve as a great means of the victory of Islam. Brilliant. Um, uh, gentlemen, um, I understand we, just, we have uh, one question who wants to ask a question. Yes, please, if, um, if you could, please. Um, I would like to add, um, um, you know, the, the signs and uh, the prophecies of uh, coming of uh, Promised Messiah, al Islam, or Imam Mahdi. Um, I was reading a hadith uh, from the book of Najmul Saqib, where it says uh, the Holy, uh, Holy Prophet said that uh, Imam Mahdi will come in 1240 years' time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it varies from a hadith to a hadith um, in different books. This is a hadith you're saying? Yes. Right. Uh, so if we add <coughs> 1240 um, plus, you know, the when uh, Holy Prophet was born 570 so it brings it you know the same uh, the age um, uh, time of uh, Hazrat Masim of Islam so that's another sign which clearly you know the uh, fulfills um, the other thing uh, like um, so I, I don't mean to cut you off but th there is one extra actually another extra point to this in uh, a revelation of the promised Messiah is um, I'm not sure if I'm correct but it's Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani this is a revelation to the promised Messiah and the promised Messiah actually mentions here that the numerical value of each and every letter adds up to 1300 Ghulam Ahmed Qadiani and you know it, it does strike you that you know, this is quite impressive and it, it obviously like you said the numerical value the numbers of the number of years after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is round about the same amount of years uh, yeah please uh, no the question I wanted to ask from uh, the discussion is uh, the uh, promised Messiah al Islam you know the um, in, in, even in a hadith it says that uh, he will come in later days um, I was talking to one of the non Ahmadis friend, and he was saying, uh, "You believe in Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, and uh, you know it's been over 100 years right. s since he passed away. Okay. So st still, you know, it's, uh, no, nothing happened as such. You know, no, um, sudden change in the it's world. No end of world or something. You know, so that's okay. what they say. So what's the? Is it metaphorical, or can we put time limit, or how can we satisfy them? Brilliant. Uh, Jazakallah, if uh, you could. Well, the Prophet Messiah Islam, himself stated once he you know, claimed to be the Prophet Messiah and established the community. He gave the glad tidings that a time period of 300 years. So obviously in those 300, pe 300 years, he you know, gave the glad tidings that this Jamaat was going to excel, it was going to spread. And obviously the Prophet Messiah Islam, came and sowed the seed and now it never has anything happened so uh, you know, quickly and overnight, that uh, within you know, say days and months, or even just a couple of years, you know, a revolution is brought about. You know, these things take time. Changing, f you know, for one person to change their faith and to you know, cause a revolution in the world, it takes time. But even in, even if we see the, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and how Islam spread as well, it wasn't overnight. It it took takes time. Similarly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is going to take time. And I'm not too exactly sure when you know the, the, the day of judgment comes. Only God knows the uh, the knowledge of that. Exactly. I mean, uh, when we talk of the victory of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, which inshallah we pray will take place as soon as possible. I mean, however, uh, the victory of Islam and Ahmadiyya, in fact. 
obviously there should be someone to witness that victory as well. I mean, when we conquered the world of you know with, with, with conquered the hearts of each and every person and won every person into the fold of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat in Islam then who is there to, who will be there to witness this victory I and mean, even today people are witnessing each and every sign of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is a living testimony that the Jamaat is true and people from the outside to say peace symposiums people come in and they pay their you know they they, they, they pay their tributes to the Jamaat's works and what they've done in the world, the humanitarian efforts and whatnot. One man, it took one man to start, but all these people strung, sprung forth from that single person and today, not even, I mean, just over a hundred years have passed and we see that the Jamaat is causing a revolution in the world. Uh, yes, Kashif Shab, uh, Kashif Shab. This study of prophets is very unfair, I believe, to say that a prophet comes and why did not everybody accept him? Why wasn't he victorious? If we study the life history of prophets, they have to go through various hardships and they have to convey their message. Their actual purpose of coming to this world is to convey their message. What happens after them cannot be oh, everything attributed to them. You know what happened after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Even though the whole Arabia was united, many things emerged after him. People turned against the Khilafat. And there, uh, after that, an era came when many sects were created and discord and disunity disrupted. But, but the message of Islam was safeguarded and it has reached us. The Holy Quran has reached us. The message, the purpose of a prophet is to convey a message. The message of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiyani has been conveyed to us. And we see day by day how it's gaining strength. And we have even been given a prophecy that within three centuries, the purpose will ultimately be fulfilled, meaning that all all just minded, all fair minded people will accept the message of the Promised Messiah. Islam. So these things take time. We cannot judge exactly. the Prophet. I mean, the, the message of the Promised Messiah, which essentially is the message of the Holy Prophet, uh, brilliant. Jazakallah, Kashif Sahib. I mean, we shouldn't just look at the opposition uh, which is happening or taking place against the Jamaat because that may cause us to stumble. We should look at the divine grace and mercy which is being sent upon the Jamaat time and time again. <coughs> 120 years after the Promised Messiah and he spoke in such terms, he said that this will happen after me, this will happen after me. He had such certainty that this was going to happen after me. I mean, had someone been false, he would have said, I mean, not Nazarbillah, had someone been false, then he would have said that this will all happen in my lifetime. Because after me, you know, he knows that no, nothing is going to remain. But the Promised Messiah being from God and being the subordinate Prophet under, under Muhammad Rasulullah he knew that all this was to happen after him and he said that each and every success which the Jamaat will see, some of which will take place in our Jamaat in the time of uh, my life and after me, many signs will uh, take place. Uh, did you want to add something? Yes, just the prophecy, for example, I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. From a far village, he made this claim and it has been fulfilled. So these words of the Pro Promised Messiah, we witness them every day, how they're fulfilled one by one, slowly, slowly. And inshallah, all people will accept the truth of his message openly or covertly. Let's see how it happens. Would you like to, to the question of the brother, um, you know when you speak to your non-MD friend and he tells you what about the last day and you know this destruction and everything, you know, there's a hadith uh, of when the Holy Prophet ﷺ was asked once by a person that, O Prophet of Allah, when will be the last day of judgment or when will be the uh, day of judgment? And the response of the Holy Prophet ﷺ was, are you ready? So the question we have to ask our brothers is, are, are you ready? Like, the, the concept is not that, you know, the, the, the world is going to get destroyed, you know, a meteor is going to strike or a war is going to break out. All these things can happen, right? But that's not the mercy of Allah. The mercy of Allah is that all people become Muslims or come under the banner of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And that, I think, is the ultimate victory of Islam in Ahmadiyya. Jazakallah, Raza Sahib, gentlemen, for that wonderful insight. Um, yes, please. I have one question. Uh, there are two, two characters of Imam Mahdi which have been mentioned in Hadith. Number one, he will be a warrior, do the wars with uh, the Jal, and kill the Jews, even if any Jews uh, b hide behind the stones and this and that, and he'll kill the Jal at the point of Babel Lud. I think that's, that's the name. The second character is he will be the Prince of Peace, and he'll abandon the wars. The character number one, which is a warrior, always uh, refer to the uh, personality of the Jesus Christ, which is mentioned in a hadith. And uh, character number two is uh, uh, Prince of Peace, is uh, mentioned towards the 
uh, Imam Mahdi, which is going to come according to the Ahadith. So, and in other Ahadith, uh, it is clearly showed if we talk to the non Ahmadi brothers, they always mention that there are two different personalities that are going to come. Uh, in other Hadith, uh, it is uh, mentioned that uh, uh, Hazrat Isa will going to lead the prayer, prayer and at that time Imam Mahdi will come and he will ask the Imam Mahdi to lead the prayer as the Imam of uh, the Muslims, basically. So if any non Ahmadi ask these questions from us, what should we answer? Exactly. Uh, I think, yep. Yes, I'll take the first question first. Uh, the Ghazi Mahdi will c will come and shed blood. The simple answer to that is that the message of the Quran is eternal until the day of judgment. They c it cannot be abrogated for, from anything. If we think that a Mahdi will come and shed blood, it will be in direct contrast with the message of the Holy Quran. And we come back to the first point again, we have to make the interpretation. If it says, and if these are, these are true, we do not know for sure, because apparently they're against the Quran. But if we want to interpret them, we can say that he will have a spiritual battle with non-believers, and he will convince them through arguments, through divine signs, and ultimately Islam will be victorious. Because, as I said, a bloody Mahdi cannot be conceived in the light of the Holy Quran. The second thing is that people think that Mahdi and Messiah will be two people appearing at the same time. The first thing I'd like to say is that there are many, so many narrations about Mahdi, and scholars have, of all times have been confused regarding this. And the simple solution is that the most two bo most authentic books of Hadith, Bukhari and Muslim, does not mention that a time will come when Messiah and Mahdi will come together. It men it, in fact, it, it doesn't even mention the Hadith about Mahdi. We have to understand in light of Hadith that when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi spoke about Mahdi, he didn't speak about one person, rather he spoke about Mahdi as an attribute of many different people. For example, it is a famous hadith that he said that follow the sunnah of me and Khulafai al-Rashidin al-Mahdiyin. In this hadith, his Khulafa, his successors have been called Mahdi's. Similarly, it is said that the, the general who will conquer Rum, which is Byzantine at that time, he will be a Mahdi as well. And with regards to the promised Messiah it is clearly said, and this is from Musnad Ahmad bin Hanbal, it says, Yushikum and Asha minkum and Yalka e Sabna Mariyama, Imam and Mahdiyan. That it is, it is well nigh that those among who, who, of you who live to see Messiah will see him as an Imam and Mahdi, and he will be a Mahdi of his age. So the Holy Prophet ﷺ has used the adjective Mahdi with Isa al Islam as well, which shows that they are the very same person. To have two guides at the same time, it is not according to the Sunnah of God. Only one <coughs> guide at can be at the time, and the Holy Prophet said that Isa will be a Mahdi as well. So they're the same yeah. person. Exactly, like I said, wonderful. I mean, obviously, you mentioned that it's an attribute, and uh, Mahdi is an attribute of uh, people who, of a person who guides people towards um, uh, righteousness and guidance, and guided by Allah, obviously. Um, do we have any other questions uh, in the audience? Uh, yes, please. Bismillah rahman rahim <coughs> Firstly, I want to uh, add something. I think there is another hadith in Ibn Majah, La Mahdi Illa Isa. So it's also providing a proof that um, two persons are one persons. And my question is this, there is a prophecy uh, the, about the promised Messiah. He will, Yudfenu uh, Ma'ifi Kabri, that he will uh, stay with me after his death in my grave. So in practical, it is very impossible that uh, a person come and do this thing. So what does it actually mean? Jazakla, I mean, the hadith about Yudfanu Ma'i Fi Kabri. Inshallah, we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. Um, um, if I can just request you gentlemen just to uh, ponder over that. Yes, please, if you could uh, ask your question. as um, We just, in um, you know, the panel mentioned about you know, some things we're taking in a literal sense, some things we're taking in a metaphorical sense. And th this is the main allegation to come back to us. Uh, when we're speaking to non amdes is that we're taking a literal meaning when it suits us. We're taking the metaphorical essence of Hadith when it suits us. Because, you know, they obviously they have their Hadith as well, which they take literal meaning sometime and metaphorical meaning the other times. So keeping that in mind, how is, what's the best way to answer the allegation as to, you know, we're not just doing that to suit us when he, you know, kind of, um, so that's obviously, it seems like um, the gentleman said that 
we make the interpretations from ourselves that we put metaphors in when it's so what's the criteria i mean is it is there a preference that we need to give to a specific way as you've just mentioned the criteria we have is you know the holy quran that's the source of all guidance now for instance let's take an example we, as we just mentioned earlier in the opening discussion that the messiah who is going to the messiah in the hadith the prophecies have referred to him as isa ibn maryam now the holy quran is stating categorically and the hadiths are categorically stating that he has passed away. Now, we have no choice other than to uh, you know, state that this is, has to be taken in the metaphorical sense. We are compelled that we have to take this in a metaphorical sense. Obviously, we do not, I mean, like the brother said before as well, that we have two uh, hadiths regarding the Imam Mahdi. One says that he will be the Prince of Peace. The other one says that he will be, uh, you know, he will cause bloodshed. Now, if we take both of these literally, then we are setting a, a, a huge allegation against the Holy Prophet ﷺ that he's making two very completely different statements. So obviously we have to take, though we have to take some literal and some as metaphor. That we, that there's no doubt about that, we have to do that. As far as the question is concerned, as, as I just mentioned earlier as well, that we have the Qur'an as a source of guidance. It tells us exactly what how we can go about making these decisions. So obviously, uh, the Mahdi that's going to come is going to be the Prince of Peace. We, that's what we will say. That's the, literally what's going to happen. Islam is a religion of peace. The Mahdi that is going to come is going to be a Prince of Peace. Uh, the Mahdi that's going to cause bloodshed is obviously going to be taken in its metaphorical sense. So Jazakallah, Shazad Sab, does that uh, answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, Kashif Sab, yes, would you like to add yes. something? To Shazad, so what Shazad so said, you said that they say we interpret it according to our own wish. We should first explain to them that we, we interpret it according to the light of the Holy Quran. As we said earlier, we were spoken about the Ghazi Mahdi. If they want to, us to interpret it in a way which goes against the Quran, we'll say no, we won't do it. All our interpretations are in accordance with the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. So the other question was was the Mahdi was supposed, or the Messiah supposed to be buried uh, alongside the Holy Prophet The point that he would be actually be buried alongside the Holy Prophet can be explained, uh, refuted in the way that if uh, he comes to the earth and he explains his message and he brings forward the many beauties of the Holy Quran, people will not listen to him because unless they are sure that after his death he is buried in the grave of the Holy Prophet then they will say, oh, whatever you said, it was true. But until then, they will only say, well, let's wait till he dies first and see if he's buried, if he's uh, actually him. In that sense, the purpose of a coming of Mahdi would make no sense. I'd like to explain this hadith in reference with other sayings of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, where he mentions th that the Mahdi is very close to me. There are hadiths when he says that the father, name of the father of the Mahdi will be the same as the name of my father. Even his own name will be the same as my name. All these uh, pro uh, prophecies actually point towards the spiritual relationship between Mahdi and Prophet Muhammad and we find a clear reference to that in the Holy Quran where it says وَآخَرِينَ minhum in Surah Juma that in the latter people the Holy Prophet will re-emerge it is referring to a spiritual second coming of the Holy Prophet and when defining this second coming the Holy Prophet said that this will be a man from Persian descent so it clearly shows that in the latter days a man will be so spiritually connected with me that it is as though he was buried in the same grave as me. It shows that he has spent all his life propagating my message and now he is worthy of being in the same Rosai Mubarak, the same holy graveyard as I've been buried. And we know that many companions of the Holy Prophet ﷺ even wished that if they could be buried in there, like Hazrat Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar and Hazrat Aisha also wished this. Brilliant. I mean, obviously, because we see that, speaking about Yudfan Umayy fi Qabri, I mean, the Prophet Muhammad wasn't allowed to go in his lifetime to Makkah. You know, religious edicts were placed against him. So how, could, how can we imagine that his body would be taken after his demise and be buried in that same grave as the Holy Prophet So obviously, there is an interpretive uh, definition to this. And it's quite actually um, curious what the non ahmadis think of this hadith. Do they actually take it literal? I'm sure it's impossible to take it literally. Uh, Raza Sab, would you like to add something? The question uh, that was asked by the brother before, uh, and Shazasa explained that we have this, uh, basically, the standard is set by the Holy Quran. And in Tafsir uh, al-Kabir, as a Muslim, explains the qualities of the Holy Quran. And one of these qualities, uh, amongst others, is that 
uh, everything that is contained in the Holy Quran, it's, it, it doesn't go against logic. It doesn't go against the natures of, of that God has set before uh, humanity from time immemorial. And if you look at these things, the, 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 the hadith of the brother that the Messiah will be buried with the, with the Holy Prophet وسلم, it's against logic, it's against humanity, it's against morality. And all these things, they contradict the Holy Quran. And thus, we can conclude that you know, all these metaphors that we have set forth, or we, we say that these things have to be taken in a met metaphorical way, they're according to the Holy Quran, which is according to logic, which is according to the natures, uh, to the nature of God that uh, He has set in place. Uh, briefly, if you could, yep. if I could just add, speaking of a grave, the Holy Prophet we know in Hadith mentioned that in a grave there'll be a window opening towards paradise and a window opening towards hell, which shows that a grave is actually a spiritual place as well. <coughs> and again, referring to the place that the spiritual grave of the Holy Prophet وسلم, which will have a window towards the paradise, the Messiah will be in there as well. So this is a, a spiritual bond, actually. Uh, Kashif Sab. Uh, Shazad Sab, if you could please. Also, just uh, adding on from what Kashif Sab said as well, that it also has a great, much deeper meaning that to be buried in the same grave. He actually has a, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given a very uh, subtle meaning here that, you know, the, the ultimate um, you can say the achievement or the goal that was achieved by the Holy Prophet وسلم, that he spent all his life in the propagation of Islam and for the love of God and propagated his, the, the message of the Quran ultimately that will be also be the, uh, the objective and the ultimate achievement of the Prophet Messiah وسلم, that after his, uh, the, all his lifetime th this will be his achievement that at the time of his demise he would have reached that goal as well so this is also a very subtle meaning here that the Holy Prophet وسلم, has given um, if you could just uh, hand it down to the gentleman behind you. Um, I just want to uh, briefly um, mention the Jal because um, earlier on you mentioned it, and um, there is a big misconception. People think that the Jal, this is a one-eyed monster, and so on. And I've had that in the past myself. People have come up to me. Now, to my understanding, I know I shouldn't take it literally, and I understand that. I grasp that, but. How do I explain, because it's a very s sensitive issue. You can't just turn around and say, oh, it's the Christian um, you know, states or their, their economy who are putting a negative influence on, uh, on us. How can I explain in a structured manner uh, without being uh, offensive or pointy fingers or raising allegations, what would I say? How do I approach that? Because for me, this has come up uh, quite a few times recently, especially, uh, you know, this time and an age where we are, we are at the moment, you know, uh, portrayed as a very negative, we, we say we, we deliver peace, but at the moment, the way it's being portrayed in the media, especially, we are not in, in, you know, in the limelight for the right reasons. So what do I say? What do I say, you know, how do I structure? Uh, absolutely correct because I mean that is something that we all face I mean we don't know we know exactly what the definition of the Jamaat is we know exactly what the opponents say like you just said but we don't know how to merge that them two together and be polite and be you know how to uh, define that so if you could just um, add something to that yeah, well, from what the brother just said that how can we explain it to them well well, the last point that I mentioned in, in, in the answer about the sign of the 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 Mahmedi was that we have to look at this through a logical and a more rational perspective. You see, now it be, it, it's very absurd to believe that you know there's going to be a just as you had said it a one-eyed monster. I mean, just to say this, speaking to someone, uh, you know, having a having an intellectual you know debate or dialogue with someone, and then you bring about something like there's going to be a one-eyed monster. He's going to be God knows where, which part of the world he's going to be in. The Imam Mahdi is going to then claim that he is the Imam Mahdi. God appointed him as the Mahdi. Then he's going to go traveling. How he's going to go travel? And then he's going to meet this particular, this character of the imagination of this one-eyed. You know, it's it's illogical. It's irrational. It's never happened in the history of religion at all. Why do prophets come? Prophets come when the world has has gone into a complete decline, when there's completely the it, there's spiritual darkness. But whenever we have seen that such such uh, you know things have happened where creatures have come about or monsters have come about and such characters have come about it's always been that people have moved away from drifted away from god certain uh, regimes have come about certain things have come about that are working against the uh, humanity in general and against the um, the, the whole uh, uh, the theme of religion 
So this is what it also means. Again, the the jal has been described in a sense just to emphasize the the intensity of of, of what this thing's going to be like. It's, it's explained that you know it's going to have one eye and it's going to be traveling at such speed and it's going to go be, be here at one time. It's going to be there at another time. It's just to explain the intensity of that of this thing. But it's not going to be taken again in the literal sense. Again, as I've just said, that the only the thing I can I would say, obviously, the, the panel will allude further onto that. But again, speaking from a rational and a logical perspective, is that it's, it's, it's completely absurd just to believe that there's going to be a, a particular character in some place, and then Muhammad will be going there, traveling there, and trying to defeat him. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, sorry. Um, I mean, like you said, the one eye monster issue. Uh, you can scare that with a child. I mean, I don't mean any offense to anyone. You can scare that. You know, you can scare a child with this story, and he will get scared. You know, before going to bed, you tell him a story, and you want to tell him this, and he will get scared, and he won't be able to go to sleep. But if you tell this to a fully grown person, he'll think twice. He'll say, "Okay, fine, I'll kill the monster. Then what?" You know, the actual, the actual danger is not the monster. The actual danger is today the media, the opponents of Islam, the way Islam is portrayed, and the representation of Islam in today's day, how to apply a 1,400-year-old um, religion into today's materialistic world. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, sorry, the reason why I actually brought this up is because uh, I'm actually a teacher, and I had, uh, it happened to me a few occasions where students come up to me and said, sir, do you know about the Dajjal? That's, why, that's brilliant the way you actually brought that up, because what's happening is um, you know, parents are scaring their children but they're not telling them the truth. They think, oh, you have to um, put the fear of God inside them, so you say there's a one-eyed monster coming, but then as a 25-year-old, as a 20-year-old, you think, hold on, I've never seen one-eyed monster in my life. So, you know, so that's it's great you brought that up. I'm not sure I've seen a one-eyed animal. Even. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> you could, yeah, go on. So I would like to advise my Khudam brethren, and especially you as a teacher, that present the concept of Dajjal in a scientific way which will show the greatness of the Holy Prophet One example of that is that the Holy Prophet said that the Dajjal will have a donkey. He said, Hijaran, uh, Himaran Akmara. It will be a white shining donkey with lights inside. He will travel, he will have one fo foot in the east and one foot in the west. Now this clearly explains the modern uh, transport, uh, modern modes of transport, which is an airplane. And when we present the, uh, these in a, this sense and apply them to modern science, modern technology, you will find that they are very beautifully uh, vivid explanations of modern new uh, commodities which we've made in this age. So we should present the concept of Dajjal as, so that it shows the greatness of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu how he could foresee the future, the new modes of transport, and the new modes of science at that time. Brilliant, Jazakallah Kasha Sahib. Um, coming back to the audience again. Uh, uh, sorry, yes, go on, Prasad Sahib. It's a good thing you mentioned you're a teacher. When you give an assignment to a student, right, and uh, then th that, that's what I used to do in school. For example, you tell me that search or, or, or research about the Dajjal. The, the first thing people do, or students these days, they go on Wikipedia. They type in what is the Dajjal. So look at the literal meaning or, or from the, the word itself or the dictionary. What does the dictionary say about the word Dajjal? It has six different meanings that I noticed uh, when, when I was researching on this topic. And the first one is something that covers, something that covers. Generally, if you cover a chair, if you cover the ground, if you cover a room, it also refers to as Dajjal. A liar, a, a great liar, a kazab is also referred to as Dajjal. Gold in the Arabic language or treasure, it's also referred to as Dajjal. And uh, a vast group, a large group that also covers the earth or a certain specific piece of land is also called the Jal. And there's like two, three, four, five, many more. And all these meanings I have just presented you are uh, taken from Tajul Urus, which is a, uh, a well-known uh, dictionary in the, of the Arabic language. Then secondly, people think that it's one man. How can we explain that it's not one man? That's, that's a problem we're facing today, right? If you look at the, there's a hadith of the Holy Prophet ﷺ when he saw the Dajjal encircling the Kaaba, right? Everybody knows this hadith. How do we explain that? It's a vision. And in a vision or in a dream, there's one person representing a large group. If you take the dream of Hazrat Yusuf uh, ﷺ, for example, or when, when he was interpreting the dreams for the king, where seven uh, cows were eating other seven cows, which are fat cows, and you know, thinner cows and all these things, the, the whole uh, uh, incident mentioned also in the Holy Quran. 
So these cows were not to be taken literally as cows. They were representing good years after bad years, after good years after bad years, right? Same thing with this one man, one-eyed man, is representing a force. He's representing a nation, he's representing a culture, and not just one man. W taking it as one man to be taken over the whole world and everything, it's against logic, it gets, it's, against, it's, it's against rationality. And yeah. people these days especially, you know, internet and all these uh, modern uh, scientific developments, you cannot possibly explain it to anybody that this one man with one eye, which is also a disability, with one eye is going to conquer the whole world. Exactly. I mean, how can we, this has been portrayed and we take it literally for argument's sake. How can we develop a love for such a person? We believe that such a person will be a servant of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who didn't, I mean, we believe that he didn't do anything like the works of this specific uh, so-called person who was to come. So obviously we can't develop a love um, through this person with <laughs> Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, so Jazakallah, gentlemen, does that answer your question? Jazakallah, thank you very much. Um, yes, please come back to the audience. Um, um, the panel has already touched the topic, uh, taking the meaning literally, uh, is so common in um, um, non-MD um, Muslims. Uh, they take the reference that uh, the, the, um, the promised Messiah will uh, be, his name will be Muhammad, his uh, mother name uh, will be the same as the Prophet Muhammad and and uh, father name will be Abdullah. As you just mentioned, that, it, uh, that um, taking the listed meaning is not something we can quote exactly. That will happen, but this uh, the, the they they take as uh, the uh, the mullah take is as a weapon to use and to explain. I like the panel if they can explain uh, in in more in detail if possible that how we can this is a hadith uh, could be fulfilled with the promised Messiah. About the um, relatives of the Holy Prophet being the same as the same names and everything, right? Shazal, I think you touched upon the lineage. I mean, if you want to briefly, you can yeah, add so something to this. I think what Kajir Sub said is quite sufficient that this is, in fact, you know, um, the expression of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu love and the spiritual, you know, proximity of these two individuals that, you know, they're going to be so close to each other in, in spirituality and their love for each other and that as if you know their names are the same they're going to be buried in the same grave which we've which we've spoken to earlier but the point that i want to make with reference to this is that if everything was so clear cut if, if everything was that you know his name was going to be the same as the holy prophet sallallahu name his parents name was going to be the same as the holy prophet sallallahu parents name then i feel that this just defeats the whole purpose and objective of faith within faith you have an element of test of a trial where when a person comes, he claims something, and there's a slight doubt, you see, and then you are able to distinguish the righteous from the others. So exact, So this is where we have to make the point is that this is, this is where, where, where the test of your faith is. If everything was so clear cut, then everyone, then it would be absurd to believe, you know, that, you know, no one, if someone would say that, you know, I'm not going to believe, then it wouldn't make sense. And as the brother was saying that, if there's, you know, there's going to be a one-eyed monster and stuff, so if there was, say, going to be a one-eyed monster and there was going to be someone who had exactly the same name as the Holy Prophet and he was going to be buried in, in the thing, everyone will believe. So where is the test? Where, what is faith then? So this just defeats the whole purpose of faith. And I think that hadith uh, which you mentioned, is it Ismahuka Ismi? Ismahuka Ismi. That, I mean, if we look in um, divine terms, when we talk of the Holy Prophet وسلم, being from Allah the Almighty, Allah the Almighty, when He mentions His names, He doesn't mean something which other people call Him by. That is so. But the initial definition of uh, name is the attributes which are given to the Holy, uh, Allah the Almighty. So when we say, Ismahu ka ismi, the Holy Prophet has said this, He means that His attributes will bear the same resemblance, like you said, to my attributes. And He will be exactly of the same nature, something which contradicts the Khuni Mahdi, the Mahdi who is to come and kill the, um, uh, the, the Dajjal and fight with various um, beings. Kashif Sab, would you like to add something? Like to say that the same problem <coughs> occurred at the time of Jesus Islam. You know, the followers of Jesus tried all their lives trying to prove that he was a descendant of King David Islam. How Jesus interpreted this, we know that he, he emphasized the spiritual aspect of it. He said that just as Jesus, uh, just as Hazrat Dawud Islam, David was a king, a material king of this world, 
my kingdom is in heaven and I am a spiritual king. So the prophets of God have always interpreted these prophecies, not in a literal sense, but in a metaphorical sense. Another example is that after the lifetime of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, many different families start to vie within each other. And scholars say that from this era, different uh, learned, different people started to forging a, a narration saying that the Mahdi will be from the Fatimids, the Mahdi will be from the Abbasids, the Mahdi will be from the Umayyads. So what they did was in this era was to, that in order to safeguard their own family and their, the importance of their family, these kind of hadiths were mentioned. And that is why these, these narrations have not been mentioned by Bukhari and Muslim, which are the most authentic books of hadith. We find many, like for instance, you mentioned an hadith from Ad Najm al-Saqib. If the Holy Prophet ﷺ actually said that he will come 1240 years after me, and exactly, many others should have mentioned these hadith as well. But some of these are only mentioned in few places, and some are mentioned in other places. We should look at the Holy Quran again. Every of these should be interpreted in light of the Holy Quran, and then conclusions should be drawn. Only to say that my father's name should be the same. And you know, there have been many Mahdi's over the centuries, and they base their claim only on this fact that my father was Abdullah, and my name is Muhammad. You know, the famous Mahdi of Sudan. What was his end? What was his purpose of life? He, he was a militant Mahdi. So only having a name and then make a claim, it cannot prove your claim as such. Does answer your question? Exactly. No, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other questions? Um, uh, if I could just come to you, yeah, please. Uh, just so, um, one question regarding uh, one of the these get quoted to us about uh, arrival of Prominence Messiah. Um, which is relating to the prom arrival of Prophet Messiah and bringing peace and justice to the world. Um, now, keeping in mind, obviously, Prophet Messiah came in, um, you know, over 100 years ago. Um, during his lifetime and where we are today, we don't really see peace and justice around us. There are wars taking place, you know, everything you can think of is going on. Um, now that's the question get raised to us. That if the promised Messiah was linked with our deeds, that he's going to bring peace and justice to the world, and how come he hasn't happened? I mean, obviously, like you said, um, the prophecy is that he will bring pre peace and justice to the world. So obviously the atmosphere and aura which was to be set at that time was to be of complete um, pandemonium, pandemonium and uh, you know, uh, chaos everywhere. Um, so obviously that's just one sign, uh, that's just one of the uh, ways to prove this hadith to be true even in this time. The Holy Quran again, coming back to the Holy Quran, an ultimate book, a law for mankind till the day of judgment. The Holy Quran has taught Muslims that in, in such and such circumstances, you are, allow, you are allowed to fight. So if the Mahdi comes and uh, the Messiah comes and establishes ultimate peace, it means that these verses will now have no meaning anymore. Similarly, the Holy Quran says that between Jews and Christia Christians, there will be enmity till the, end of, till the day of judgment. They will keep on fighting, struggling, even though the most fights today are based on, uh, on uh, politics, yet the religious factor always plays a role. So Jews and Christians will be en enemies until the Day of Judgment. It even says that Jews and Christians will be remain till the Day of Judgment. The question earlier was, why hasn't Islam prevailed ultimately? Why haven't everyone become a Muslim? The verses of the Quran says that discord will remain till the Day of Judgment. So now again, we have to make an, a literal, uh, an, a metaphorical interpretation of this hadith, saying that, again, we, we use this principle that we're not doing it according to our own wishes, we're doing it according to the Quran. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said that the Messiah will come and establish peace among us. The hadith is, وَلَتَزْهَبَنَّ الشَّحْنَا وَالتَّبَاغُزْ وَالتَّحَاسُدْ At the time of the Messiah, internal discord and disunity and fights will disappear. And this, is, this can be referred to his community. Within the Ahmadiyya community, we have no such mention of fights, uh, wars taking place between us. Everyone who joins the community enters into a spiritual bond, and that spiritual bond is revived on every time MTA shows a Jalsa live. Like, for instance, we saw today the Jalsa in Holland. How is it that everyone feels like we're present there? We're in this spiritual relationship. There's such peace everywhere. So love and peace is our message, and we act according to it. It is a great miracle indeed that the Messiah came, he established a community. That community has been growing into millions. And all these millions of people believe in peace as the ultimate message of Islam. We go door to door saying that Islam is a message of peace. So this is a blessing to find for the 
community of the Promised Messiah that we will propagate peace wherever we go. And this was fulfilled in his prayer. Sub, and um, with that, I'm, I'll have to apologize to the audience because that's um, all we do have time for. And I'd like to wrap up with this uh, question, uh, gentlemen, if you could please answer this. That I mean, we've accepted the fact that a specific person was prophesied to come by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But how do we prove that Hazrat Mirza Sahib, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian alayhi salatu wasalam, who propagated his message from the humble village of Qadian in the 1800s, was that specific person who was prophesied and promised by um, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Kashif Sahib. A literal and a metaphorical study of our these give us, gives us the following picture. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a man will come, his attributive name will be Jesus, son of Mary. He will come at a time when the cross will be at the peak, meaning Christianity will be strong at that time. He will come in an era when Muslims will fall into internal disputes and discords. Many sects will emerge. He will come in a time when uh, different voices will be apparent on all over the globe. He will come and revive faith and give Muslims the right interpretation of Islam. He will make Islam prevail over other faiths. And he will come in a state where he will suffer from two ailments. It is also mentioned in hadith. He will have two ailments. And this was fulfilled in the life of the Promised Messiah Islam. And even though he had many physical, uh, f many physical ailments, still, if we study his life, the way he served Islam, even though he was in this state, it is amazing to study. Even though when he used to write his books, sitting in his home, sitting in his home, writing his books, suffering from headache, suffering from diabetes, and even the heat and everything, you know, the, the climate of India in the summer especially, he used to sit and write his works, publish them, look over and educate his followers. Everything he did this in a state of physical weakness. And that shows the greatness of the Promised Messiah alayhi So all these things were fulfilled in his life. And there is no need whatsoever for us to wait for another one because we have found the Promised Messiah alayhi fulfilling the purpose of, an, of the advent of a spiritual reformer. Brilliant. Uh, and with that, I would like to say that we can understand from all this discussion that the coming or the, the issue of the coming Messiah and Mahdi is no small issue. It was a very big one in the sight of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who spoke of this issue with great emphasis and paid great attention to this specific person who is to come and save humanity from all the ills of society, those ills which when man falls in even today, he is not aware he is committing a sin. And obviously we've also understood in this program that the language used by Allah the Almighty and his noble servant Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sublime. It has a sublime touch to it and it cannot be taken literally. Literalism is something which is unfortunately making our Ummah, the entire Muslim nation look like a sign of mockery and ridicule is held against Islam due to these um, fairy tale like fables which are told to our children and uh, the youth within Islam and they convey it when they grow up and this, this, this system and this cycle of telling fables to our children just continues. It is unfortunate but a fact that Muslims are the ones responsible for this image which is portrayed by the media and they are responsible for the way Islam is perceived in this day and age. Ahmadiyyat is the only hope today which which can represent Islam in the true meaning and can give a better and more believable meaning to the word Islam and the belief of Muhammad Rasulullah and the final message of God Almighty. Ahmadiyyat is the only belief within Islam which has declared all innovative notions to be false and has given a more believable way to apply this 1400 year old religion or apparent 14, 1400 year old religion in today's modern day and applied it very uh, perfectly. So with that, I mean, I would like to read out a passage from the writings of the Promised Messiah uh, This can be found in The Essence of Islam. The Promised Messiah states, and I quote, my statement concerning the Promised Messiah whose descent from heaven and second advent into the world is awaited, which God Almighty has disclosed to me by His grace and mercy, is that there is no mention in the Holy Quran of this second advent of Jesus. According to the Holy Quran, i.e. the physical appearance of that Messiah who came over 2,000 years ago, that person cannot come uh, again, but another person will come. I, I don't believe in a person who will come uh, from 2,000 years ago. I quote again, according to the Holy Quran, 
Jesus has departed from this world forever. Some ahadiths, which are replete with metaphors, predict the second advent of Jesus. Their context indicates that they do not predict the second coming of Jesus, son of Mary, but comprise metaphorical statements, which mean that in the age that would resemble the age of Jesus, son of Mary, a person will resemble Jesus, son of Mary, in his temperament, power, and function. And furthermore, he states that God Almighty has revealed to me that I am that promised Messiah. So gentlemen, with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for shedding great light into uh, the ahadith regarding the promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam. I'd like to thank our audience for representing um, the audience at home in a very uh, great manner. And most of all, I would like to thank our audience at home. Please do continue to pray for the success of the program. Until next time, from all of us here at Beacon of Truth, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Allahumma